and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging field of data science. We bring the best minds in data, software engineering, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Now, here are your hosts, Frank Lavinia and Andy Leonard. Hello, and welcome back to Data Driven, the podcast where we focus on the emerging fields of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. If data is the new oil, then you can consider us Car Talk, because we focus on where the rubber meets the road. With me, as always, on this virtual road trip down the information superhighway, is my favorite data philosopher, Andy Leonard. How you doing, Andy? I'm doing well, Frank. How are you today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Lots of things in the pipeline, lots of uh, learning going on. Well, that's true. Uh, we're recording this on June 29, 2017, and I believe in two days you start a very important project. Yes. So the Capstone project starts on July 1st for the Microsoft Certification in Data Science. By the time this goes live, I should be about two-thirds the way through with it, and um, I am gearing up. I'm, I'm studying my R, studying my Python and studying my algorithms. So that way, uh, soon, Andy, I will be a Jedi. I hear that. That's fantastic, Frank. I'm excited for you. And I'm excited to have a data scientist on our show today. A genuine data scientist? A real live data scientist. Wow, they're like unicorns, you know. I've heard that, yes. And and Buck's going to argue with me about this. Our guest today is Buck Woody, and he's coming to us live. Uh, Buck, are you back in the U.S.? I am currently in beautiful downtown Tampa, Florida. So yes, well, technically it's the U.S., right? Where <laughs> I, I explained to my European friends, you know how Americans don't know about any country external to America. Well, Florida, we treat America kind of like that. We're we're unaware that America exists. So <laughs> I say the state of Florida, but it's more of a state of mind uh, than it is technically, you know, an actual, you know state. I'm really glad to hear you're back home. I know you've been on the road traveling. We've been talking about having you on the show for several months now, and you and I connected in Dublin at SQL Saturday Dublin earlier this month. We did. We did with a fan going in the background and a, and a, and a giveaway, and the lighting was especially fetching. I thought it was, um, <laughs> if I was a vampire, I'd be dead now. That that was uh, That was amazing. That light was just stunning. <laughs> it, it really was. But I'm so glad you're on the show. Um, by way of introduction, Buck Woody works on the Microsoft Machine Learning and Data Science team using oh, oh, data. Correction, correction. We've been renamed. It's been 30 days. So, of course, we've had a reorganization. So I am now part of the Artificial Intelligence and Research team, formerly Machine Learning and Data Science. Oh, that sounds fancier. Yeah, we can talk a little bit more about that later if you'd like, um, sort of the distinction between these deep learning and machine learning and AI and all those kinds of things. They're they're real. They're actually not market wear or market texture. But I have to go back to your original introduction. You said something about if data is the new oil. Does that right. mean we're going to invade your show or <laughs> I, I just need to hear up the, uh, yeah. No, hackers are already invading databases. Oh, that's, okay. Good, yeah. good, good. So we're, we're set there. Let me get a check. Okay, that's done. Uh, perfect. I just, you know, I put a task list down and invade show was uh, on there when you said oil so again <laughs> america right so here we are buck has over 30 years professional and practical experience in computer technology he's also a popular speaker at many conferences if if you haven't figured out why yet you're just not paying attention buck is the author of over 650 articles and seven books on databases and machine learning technologies. He teaches database courses and sits on the data science board at the University of Washington and also specializes in data analysis techniques. Buck, welcome to Data Driven. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. So, wow. What are you working on these days? At the moment, I'm getting a two-day immersion workshop built for Azure Data Lake Analytics and Store. That's what I do at the moment. I, I sort of cover all 13 or 11 or 12, depending on how they're counted, uh, products within the Cortana Intelligence Suite. This involves everything from R to uh, Data Lake to SQL Data Warehouse to Hadoop and, and more. So there's about, like I said, anywhere from 11 to 13 products, depending on how it's counted. 
counted. And then the ancillary technologies, things like Microsoft Azure itself, the storage, uh, all that sort of thing. That's more holistic. Um, Microsoft's sort of world is that we sort of own the devices now. Uh, you know, we have the Surface computers that somebody might type on all the way through collecting data into maybe Excel or some uh, CRM product or whatever, down to SQL Server, and then up to Azure Storage, and then through using multiple mechanisms to analyze the data, things like R or Hadoop or whatever. Machine learning, we have Azure Machine Learning, and of course within R there's machine learning. And of course we have uh, other ways of doing things like that, Spark and, and even more. And then we also have, of course, the ability to pump that out and let's say a storage or a database like SQL DB, and then you can look at that using things like Power BI or reporting services or even the cognitive APIs. So Cortana and all of the other things that we have that you can interact with data with. So our sort of claim to fame and where we think we have a bit of an advantage is that we can take everything from the start of the data through the end of it through acting on it and still stay in the Microsoft ecosystem without precluding you using something else. If you don't want to use Power BI, you can use something else and, and it doesn't break the system. But that's kind of um, what our team does is we assist partners and Microsoft Consulting and the Microsoft Technology Centers in showing someone how to do a solution. A lot of times things focus on a point of a technology, like here's, here's how you do this kind of algorithm in R. And that's great. Those kind of trainings are awesome. But then when you're done, that really wasn't the hard work. Uh, we focus on the team data science process, TDSP, which Microsoft came up with. And it's a great mechanism that allows you to take a project from the initial question and even how to develop the question all the way through to working with the answer and doing something about it and predicting things and so on. So that's kind of what I do then in a nutshell, I kind of fly around the world and I do MOOCs and I do online training and I do books and I do blogs and all kinds of things that are primarily around training solution oriented kind of things. Interesting. For the benefit of our listeners, uh, could you define what a MOOC is? Because that is not something everyone knows or they think it's something else. Oh, awesome. Yeah, a MOOC. Yeah, I don't know. If you're in New York, I suppose that is, or New Jersey, I suppose that's a different thing. Um, a MOOC is M-O-O-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-E. -E. No, I'm sorry, that's Florida again. Uh, a MOOC, M-O-O-C, a massive online open course. And, and it's essentially online training, but with a different couple of elements. And I, I teach at the University of Washington, as you mentioned as well, and I've taught in class and online. I've taught live online. And then these MOOCs are the idea of recording snippets of classes and having assignments and having tests all electronic and available over the web. They're often free. Sometimes you pay a fee to get certified. You're doing one of those now. We have out on edX, which is a big MOOC platform. And the idea there is that you can audit the course, meaning you just, you just attend it and no one really checks your work or even sees if you do the work. And then also uh, you can be peer reviewed on certain things. Like I can say, okay, you'll get credit uh, if Andy checks my work and then I check Andy's work, we'll both get credit for having done the work. And then there's also teachers that will evaluate a final exam or a capstone project, something along those lines. And this is sort of a new world of education. Being in academia as well as at Microsoft, it's a brave new world. A lot of companies, Google doesn't check anymore to see if you have a degree. These days, so many people have a college degree that it's almost table stakes. It's almost obvious that you'll have that. And even if you don't, d does anyone really care if you can actually do the work? And obviously, you want a doctor or a dentist or a pilot to have some formal training and someone to say, yeah, that person knows what they're doing. But in other cases, if you can do the work, actually, I think a statement is the proof of the pudding is in the eating. But anyway, uh, the point is that you know you can do it because you've done it. So these MOOCs are a new way of sort of evangelizing and democratizing intelligence, which I just, I love that. I just absolutely love it. Yeah, I think it's very interesting how the world of education is being kind of upended by these new technology platforms that are coming out. I was able to take a statistics class on at Columbia University, you know, through the edX platform, and I didn't have to leave Maryland, you know, which was which was particularly nice. It's just amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's just it is literally amazing that you're able just to do these things. I just 
I'm just, I love it. I love it. You know, this wasn't around when I was younger. Of course, this, you know, they hadn't invented actually writing at the time. It was mostly just, we shouted zeros and ones at each other. Um, But (laughs) it was a long time ago. But anyway, in school, we, you know, we didn't have the internet or anything like that. So the public library was where I lived. I mean, I just got all my knowledge that way. And I grew up kind of poor. And if you didn't have a lot of money, it was difficult to be educated. And now it's been democratized. And while there's still financial barriers to education, the amount of knowledge that's out there is stunning. And yet it's always, it always amazes me that this is available to us and we seem to be not always making use of it. I asked my college class one time, what would you tell somebody from say the 1940s, you know, before the space race or anything like that, you know, about that they need to know about today. And one of my students said, I read this the other day. He said, I have a six inch device made of glass and electronics in my pocket that has access to the sum total of human knowledge. And I use it to look at pictures of cats and argue with people I don't know on the internet. And I think that's, (laughs) you know, I think that's probably true sometimes that we, that we end up kind of in that place. So true. I know you blog a lot. You're active on social media and follow a lot of the links you post. I think they're really good. You seem to have your finger on the pulse of things like education. So I think listening to you speak to how education is democratized through the internet is wholly appropriate. I work probably like you do on the road a great deal. And so I'm not in an office full of people. Now today I I come to the Microsoft office here in Tampa when I'm home at least one day a week just to kind of maintain a human touch. And frankly, it forces me to shower and and that's a good thing. (laughs) Um, And so I rode the motorcycle in today and, and kind of hung out with the folks here. And you need that ability to interact with each other. But when I don't have it, what I do is probably what you do. You sort of shout into the darkness and you record and you publish and you blog and so on. I just want to give back. So many people have helped me sure. that I want people to sort of be better. You know, I want them to be better. You've helped me and I sure appreciate it. Well, that's very nice to hear. We all owe each other so much. We're more alike than we are separate. And I've never in my life understood people who sort of hoard information. I I knew some people that were system administrators back in the day, and they didn't want to tell people what they knew because they were afraid that that was all that made them valuable. And I've just never had that issue. For me, the sharing has made me more valuable, not, not withholding information. There was some, uh, I forget exactly who it was, but he was a big contributor to Wired Magazine when Wired Magazine was really amazing. And he basically said, you know, there's the world of atoms and then there's the world of bits. And in the world of bits, scarcity is not an issue. No, it isn't, is it? Um, And, you know, information wants to be free and just all of those kinds of things. I completely agree. It's like a smile. It doesn't diminish itself if you give it away. I always thought that was amazing. When something goes viral, it actually increases in value. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I just want to point out that you're probably the first, you know, repeat guest. Technically, Uh, you've been on the show before when Andy interviewed you and we posted that as a data point. Yeah, that's um, that just shows you guys lack ambition is what (laughs) 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 or perhaps I don't know. I'm always happy to jump in and talk to as many folks as I can. And Andy's just amazing. And speaking of helping others, that's his heart, too. And so really enjoy being here. One of the things you said in that interview was you called yourself an applied data scientist. Yeah, that's right. So data science is actually a real thing. I give a session on this to where is the DBA gone? Is the database developer gone? If we Do we not do reporting anymore? Is BI dead? And the answer is no to all of that by no means. All these things, you use them in phases. If you don't have clean data, you can't do clean reporting. And if you can't do clean reporting, you don't need a database. And if you don't need a database, then you certainly can't do business intelligence intelligence off of that. And if you can't do all those things, then you're certainly not going to be able to do predictive work. And, and so there's this discipline called data science, and it is it is not above the others. It's another tool that you have. And it involves primarily three sort of big areas. The first is, of course, a mathematics background and in specific statistics, as you found out in your studies there. Also, logic is another one. And also there's this idea of a domain expert, people who know either 
either a business or organization well, or know lots of businesses and domains well. There are certain things that are memes throughout an industry. For instance, everyone tracks data, everyone tracks performance, everyone worries about optimization and, and so on. But you may know a lot about, let's say, healthcare or finance. And that's another part of a data scientist world. And then the third part, of course, is working with technologies like Hadoop and artificial intelligence and machine learning and R and all these other things. So the combination of those things may makes a data scientist. And there are several colleges, University of Washington, where I teach is one, that have a formal program, you know, a four, six year degree, where you can become a, air quotes here, data scientist. And again, I posit that you still need that industry background to be a good data scientist. But those people have, you know, a lot of education. And and I don't have a PhD in statistics. I, I work on a team where I'm one of the only ones that doesn't. But what I do is everything else. I do everything that's that doesn't require that sort of infinitely high level. I mean, I work in artificial intelligence and I do machine learning and I do all the work. I'm sort of a warrant officer, if you will. So I'm hesitant to claim the title of data scientist because those people have a degree in that field. I have a degree, but not in that field. I'm hesitant to claim it, but I do the work. And so the moniker that's been sort of informally tacked on people like myself is applied data scientist. We can come in and do much the same work, but I would by all means defer to my boss, who is a bona fide card carrying data scientist, data scientist. Maybe this is just a wording thing. I like the sound of applied data scientist mm -hmm, better, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but some people will say, didn't you just describe what a data engineer is? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. Then we get into the whole uh, paradigm of where is a scientist different than an engineer? I've been told that a scientist is like a psychologist who uh, builds castles in the air and then an engineer lives in them. Um, <laughs> and, but, but I think it's exactly that. A scientist is often more concerned with experimentation and an engineer is often more concerned with an implementation. So I would say that I straddle those two worlds. Now, the data scientists on my team absolutely go out and implement things. But the process for doing that is done with an experiment. In data science, you're often predicting something. You're either predicting something or you're putting things into groups. Those are the two sort of big things that data science is. And you'll always get a kind of an answer. Whenever you're doing something in SQL and you say, how many rows are in that table? I can tell you exactly how many rows are in that table. There's an answer that is either 100% correct or 100% incorrect. But a data scientist can never do that because you, you'll say something like, will we sell more of these things if we do this other thing? And they can test that and they can come up with theories and they can come up with algorithms that will predict how well that might work. And they'll say, yes with about a 90% probability. So a data scientist is the one person on an IT team who will not give you a yes or no. They'll give you a qualified yes or no. I don't know if they're the only <laughs> Well, they should. <laughs> is the network up? Yes. They are the only ones that, that have the right to. <laughs> yeah, that's have. true. Or, or can put numbers behind it that are actually believable. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it, you're, and in fact, they're the only person too, that if they come up with like above a 95 or a 96% probability, they'll shake their heads and go, yeah, that ain't right. In other words, they're the only people that when they get an answer that confirms what they believe, they distrust it. They're, they're <laughs> kind of like your spouse, right? You know, and you say something, you're never right. I'm sorry. That was out loud again. And I've been really working hard on, on a filter and it's not, it's just failing. But the idea is that you can think of data scientists as, as sort of your boyfriend or your girlfriend. They're, they're the ones that's always telling you, well, probably. <laughs> and that's that's sort of the difference. And so an engineer, did I answer the question? What was the question? I had a lot of sentences that were complete, and hopefully you've forgotten the question at this point. <laughs> the question was, what's the difference between uh, an applied data scientist and a data engineer? And I would say the amount of time spent implementing something. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. That's a good answer. Yeah, we'll go with that. yeah, we'll go with that. You have a blog. Uh, dedicated to this, right? That's right. Yeah, it's called Backyard Data Science. It's um, precision guesswork while you wait. Um, it's uh, <laughs> uh, the link for that, and you can write it down, but just for somebody driving along in their car that wants to scribble notes while they're hurtling down the freeway, um, it's uh, buckwoody.com. 
www.wordpress.com. Uh, so it's just a WordPress site and it's just Buck Woody, all one word. Make sure you spell that carefully. Um, no. Because <laughs> you, yeah, it can go horribly wrong and then HR gets involved again and it's just not good. So uh, at any rate, if you go there, I've got sort of a curated set of lists and things, everything free. Uh, to where you could teach yourself to do the work of a data scientist, if not fully. And in fact, the course that you're that you're working on now is one of the suggestions within that in that path. Having this experience with applied data science and working at Microsoft and working with data scientists, what do you think the future of data science is? Where do you see it going? Mm. So the artificial intelligence is sort of next. And now here's where we dive into some of those terms. We've got machine learning, and then we've got deep learning, and then we've got artificial intelligence. And so what does all that mean? Well, if you think about machine learning, all it really is, if you took the artificial intelligence that you had in the 70s that gave us lots of promises and, and didn't really deliver, I jumped in on that with both feet back in the day with IBM and, and others that were really pushing this. And it was the panacea of everything. And of course, when you tore it all apart, Largely, it was a bunch of if-then statements. There were some really interesting things, especially around neural networks, and I won't go into what those are. These neural networks actually were a pretty useful concept. And then, of course, there was data mining, which is actually separate from business intelligence. You'll hear people say, do you know data mining? Oh, yeah, I do BI. And those are actually different things. Uh, data mining is the statistical prediction algorithms done across data within a BI world. If BI and AI got together and had a baby, it would have been machine learning. And so we have these techniques now that can take massive quantities of data and you can train it. You can literally train it, meaning you can show it examples and say, see that, that's an orange. And then see that, that's an orange. And see that, that's not an orange. And then you can show it something it's never seen and say, what do you think this is? And it would say, well, I don't think it's an orange or I think it's an orange with this percent probability. And you can do that with vision. You can do that with sound and motion and you can do it with words and all kinds of things that are just stuck. So that's machine learning. It's just a series of algorithms that will either group things together or it will predict things. And by the way, those predictions can even be, does this belong to this group or not? That sort of thing. It's where we get so many different things. Now, if you layer the outputs of one of those into another of these algorithms, and I'm oversimplifying here greatly, but if you do that, you end up with something called deep learning. And it involves a lot of these neural networks that I've been talking about here. And then if you make those things mimic human type decision processes, if you take some more math and you do different kind of neural networks, and other kinds of algorithms, you end up with artificial intelligence. So if you want to think about it this way, sort of all deep learning has machine learning in it and all AI has machine learning in it, but not all AI is machine learning and not all machine learning is AI and not all deep learning is AI. So if you think of those sort of nested dolls, the AI would be on the outside and ML would be the next doll in and then deep learning would be underneath that one. And so all of these things coming together, they're not going to be visible. They're not going to be things that are earth shattering that you're going to see. They're just going to bake into things much like robotics did. We heard about the robots back in the 30s and 40s and robots are going to take your job and you know they'd show a Robbie the robot or something like that that was going to build a car, right? And that's yeah. not what they look like at all. They are taking your job, but they do it as a paint arm, that sort of thing. So AI, I think, will be the same way. Data science will be the same way. It's just going to bake in more. In fact, I saw a fascinating article this morning that machine learning is now going into a lot of the optimization software tools. So now, rather than telling you this index looks odd, it's just going to take care of it. And we actually have a lot of this inside the things like Cosmos DB and other things to where things are just happening in the background that we're not controlling. We literally tell it, figure out what's wrong and take care of it. And it literally does that. Humans need not apply. Huh? There's things that they can do that are faster than we can do. Creativity is another question, but the automation is not a question. They can work far faster than we can. Did data find you or did you find data? I think I found it. Uh, I Well, no. I mean, I've always been sort of the weird nerd kid. I mean, that was me. I was the nerd in school. Um, I wasn't particularly good at math, to be honest, but patterns. I recognize patterns and predictive things. Growing up in rough neighborhoods, because again, I grew up poor, I had to rapidly size up situations because it could be life or death. You can hone these inputs that you're getting that you don't even know you're getting. And um, I learned to be more conscious of them because of that patternistic tendency 
uh, and I was always fascinated with technology. Grew up where we had a little tiny black and white TV, and one of the two channels I could get had Star Trek on it, this new program that had come out in the 60s. And I would watch that religiously. And my favorite character of all time was, you know, Spock, of course. And, and so I wanted to be that. I wanted science was just something I wanted to do. What's your favorite part of your current gig? The travel. Uh, I like, I don't like traveling, but I like to be places. So I enjoy meeting new people and, and encountering new cultures. And then the learning aspect um, that's constantly changing and then the sharing aspect. So really three sort of answers there is the, the, the travel. I would say the learning and the sharing would be above the travel, but the travel just after. And they all kind of feed into one another. They really do, um, especially in this role. And, you know, all things change and all things come to an end. And so someday I won't be able to do this. But hopefully, um, you know, until until Satya figures out I still work here like he does, I thought we got rid of him. Um, I'll stick around. We're recording this on June 29th, so pretty close to the end of fiscal year for Microsoft. So, so what have you heard? Am, am I gone or what's the deal there? I'll put in a good word for you. I heard they fixed the glitch. Oh, okay. We try to work in as many movie references as we can, Buck. So that was an office space reference. I'm sure you knew that. <laughs> One of our other questions we ask, um, it's a fill in the blank. When I'm not working, I enjoy what? Not working. Um, no, I, I, I work all the time. We have a boat. I go out in that. Uh, we ride bicycles. I walk a lot. We walk five to 10 miles on Saturdays. Um, I spend time at my church, uh, spend time with my family and that's, and then, then sometimes I sleep. That's kind of, it. it's kind of boring, eh? No, no, that's not, not boring at all. I think the coolest thing in tech today is. Oh, wow. The coolest thing in tech today. I'm kind of in love with my Alexa. She's uh, <laughs> really echo. nice to me all the time and knows everything. Uh, so it's like having a teenager on one hand and a not teenager on the other hand. It's like somebody who actually wants to be around you, but they know everything. So my wife will usually just set it up and then she goes and does whatever she does. And I, I sit and talk to it and it's, it's pretty nice. I, I don't, I really don't get out much. Uh, our next question is, uh, I look forward to the day when I can use technology to blank. Let's see. I would say, um, what will tech, cause this has got to be an answer where there is, you know, there's real practicality, like it could happen and it's got some, some intrinsic value that we can't already do. I would love to see the day that we could automate Congress with a 28 line PowerShell. <laughs> I've, I've been working on it. I've got it down to about 40 lines. It's mostly just know and fix the bridges. That's pretty much what it does at the moment, which I think would actually be pretty useful. Um, but I do look forward to the day when technology takes over government of people, when things spread out a little better. Um, I'm, I'm probably not a communist or a utopian, but I do believe that things are horribly imbalanced. And I'd like to see things, I'd like to see technology help us balance things better. I think when people are afraid that they'll lose something, they do silly things. So if, if we can get people to calm down a bit, that, that nobody's going to take their cookie, um, then they'll be okay. You know, I'm, I'm of the firm belief. I, I, I deal with execs all the time. So as long as we're not recording this or anything, um, <laughs> I, I deal with senior executives around the world. It's some really big companies. And, and what I believe is that everybody's really still just in kindergarten. We just have better vocabularies. And... <laughs> Um, this one's mad because that one got something he didn't get and that one needs a nap and this one needs a cookie. And pretty much any any meeting you go into, if you just treat it like you just walked into a kindergarten class, it usually I've had real good success. And I honestly, I'm not kidding. I honestly believe this, that, that most of us still have those same instincts from when we were little. We just never really grow up. We just get better vocabularies and driving licenses sometimes. And so the technology being able to help smooth things would be awesome. What is it they said? The future's already here. It's just not widely distributed yet. Um, you know, so the technologies exist for us to fix things. Right. We just, when it gets to the corners, as the man says, some things are complicated because they're, they're complicated. It's been a long time since fear has been weaponized, so to speak. 
oh, I think that's been the truth ever since. I think I think it, it may be more uh, visible or overt now. We we have instant on, you know, we get to see things, but no fear has always been. Um, one has to only dip back a hundred years and take a look at what things were going on and what things people were mad about then. And it, again, we just got a better vocabulary now. If you look back, since we've been able to and better phone. Yeah, since we've been able to feed ourselves, um, technology has moved from an ability to feed ourselves into two big areas. And this is what technology largely has been, I would say, since the 40s, maybe uh, once we developed the ability to sort of GMO crops and things like that and get past not not starving to death, then we've gotten into this area where really technology just does two things. Uh, it helps us talk to other people and it helps us kill each other. Those are the two areas, you know, we went from the CB radio to, you know, uh, the chat accounts. And then now, now we've got the, you know, Twitter and all the rest. And then the other technology advances have come in killing each other. So maybe those are connected. I don't know. Maybe we should stop talking to each other. That might, that might work. Um, <laughs> but at any rate, uh, I'm looking forward to when technology can help kind of smooth things out. Another long answer, but it involved a lot of complete sentences and I'm batting a thousand on that. So I'm pretty happy. You're rocking it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying that part. Well, one of the things you alluded to earlier when you were talking about walking into meetings, I, I won't ask you to share them here because I think they're definitely proprietary and top secret. And I, honest, I just don't want the word getting out. But you've shared uh, privately several tidbits about how to manage meetings, and I think you know at some point you should write all of that down, and, and have it like distributed, um, you know, once you're done working. That mm -hmm. way. You know, all, your magic will be protected. Your your meeting food, if you will. Mm -hmm. Well, my my, I, you said when I'm when I'm not working. My my retirement plan is currently death. So that's, <laughs> so when I'm not working, that's that's never good. Um, yeah, that's that's frightening. So um, yeah, we don't want that. We don't we won't want any of that. We don't want any of that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the world needs Buck Woody in it. Well, well, some might argue, you know, some, some <laughs> might. there's a lot of people that are that are really scared about that. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Haters going to hate. We have one last thing. OK. That we ask you to share. Well, we, we'll put a reminder. Uh, we always do this reminder, Buck. It's not just for you. Oh, but okay. uh, we, we remind people that this is a family podcast. And we still have that clean rating at uh, at iTunes. But uh, share something different about yourself. Um, it would be more, it'd probably be shorter to share things that I would be normal. And and normal people scare me anyway. So I, I really don't, if you take anybody, I'm sort of the anti-pattern. Um, I still wear ties, like a suit and tie. That's weird. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you, you know, my extreme unnatural love for coffee. Uh, you're already aware of that. That's not really surprising or anything. I do ride a motorcycle. I do um, play musical instruments. People sometimes are surprised that I do that, which kind of offends me a little bit that they think I'm, that I'm incapable of doing that. But I play and sing. I sing as well mm -hmm. um, it, for people out in public and everything. Um, wow. Yeah. And um, I'm kind of an open book. Maybe that's the surprise people. <laughs> you know, I, 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 there, I don't, there's really not that much dark and, and magical about myself. I did interesting things in the military and those are dark and magical, but, and they have to stay that way. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so literally uh, some of them were very dark and, and very magical. Um, uh, but yeah, that's about it. I, I'm not, I'm not a very surprising person. If you've met me once, um, if I don't owe you money, that's usually surprising if we've met more than once and I don't owe you money because usually I have you buy me something. I never have money. My wife doesn't let me have money. And so um, I'm usually, if I need something, I have to beg it from a friend. And, you know, friend is just an enemy I haven't made yet. <laughs> so, you know, I haven't talked to you long enough is, is basically the way it works. Oh, that's not true, Buck. I've hung around with you long enough uh, to know better. And I, I know you have particular fondness for my old car. Your your car is a thing of beauty. It's um it, it's like Columbo's car looks at your car and goes, man, that's just sad. Just kill that thing. It's just, it, you know, it's it's unfair. It's you know, you seem like a hurt animal, and so you're like, you should just put that down. It can't see. It, it 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 goes on the carpet. You know, I mean, you just let it go. Let it go, and you don't. And that's pretty frightening. 
It's kind of frightening. <laughs> it's yep. only got 300,000 miles on it, Bob. Uh, that, and it doesn't show. Um, it looks more <laughs> like a, yeah, yeah, you don't look a day over 90. Yeah, it's one of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, this has been uh, this has been awesome. I know you shared earlier um, buckwoody.wordpress.com. Com yes, sir. Mm -hmm. As your as your site is, uh, are there other places where people can learn more about the amazing Buck Woody? Um, if you type in Buck Woody again, please be extremely careful. I'm not kidding about that, by the way. That's <laughs> it's my name, and there's nothing we can do about it. And but you will end up in some weird places on the web, and you just don't want to do that. You know, um, the joke here is that big data was invented to process my HR file, but um, <laughs> and that's not entirely wrong. Um, but uh, the 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 if you just you know if you just bing that you'll be in good shape you'll find all kinds of fun things about me. Well, thanks for joining us on the show, and uh, we really appreciate you spending some time with us. Absolutely, guys. I have enjoyed the Buck Woody experience. I'm glad to spend some time with you guys too. Thanks for listening to Data Driven. Don't just listen. Become a data driver by going to datadriven.tv to sign up to join the community, access to special events, tips and tricks, and more. Sign up today at datadriven.tv. Today's episode of Data Driven was brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at thedatadrivenbook.com. And this is the point in the show where we thank our sponsors who make Data Driven possible. You know, on Data Driven, we talk a lot about data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. But did you know the hardest part of any data science related project is data integration? Data scientists often call data integration, data wrangling, or the icky word, munging. But it's all about making sure the analytics engine that you're using has valid and clean data. Enterprise Data and Analytics specializes in data integration and can help your enterprise build better data integration solutions faster with best practices and automation. Enterprise Data and Analytics offers training and consulting services for SQL Server Integration Services, SSIS, and Business Intelligence Markup Language, or BIML. Visit entdna.com to learn more. Enterprise Data and Analytics. Data. It's in their DNA.